Thanks, Lee, for joining us at the uh, Engage Nation podcast, first ever episode. Um, yeah, let's let's hear a little bit about your background first, I suppose, diving straight into it. Um, tennis scholarship, Wake Forest and, and Georgia Tech, Wall Street, and now you're doing something completely different. But let's go, let's uh, let's start from the start. You know, um, where did your love for sport begin? And tell us about your college career. Yeah, so my love for sport really began from birth. I, you know, I'm one of three girls in my family. I'm actually an identical twin, and our father played football at the University of Georgia. So it kind of grew up between the hedges, as we say in the South. And he would take us to football games. He would take us to college basketball games. So instead of, you know, playing with Barbies and doing all that, we were really watching sports. I grew up, you know, watching the old school NBA, the the Jordan Bird, you know, Magic Johnson era with my father. So that's really the impetus, the very beginning. I've always loved, genuinely loved sports. I've always been a sports fan. Amazing. And uh, obviously tennis was your, your, your uh, full, full ride scholarship. Tell us a bit about that, that, that part of your college, college life. Yeah. So instead of, you know, going to daycare, my mom would kind of drop us off at the city park and my sister and I would play tennis together all day long. So we were both full scholarship division one tennis players. I started out at Wake Forest, was there for two years, and then for various reasons, got an in-conference waiver to go over to Georgia Tech. Um, my identical twin was at Georgia Tech, and so we got to play together for a couple of years and then graduated from there. And then as soon as I graduated, moved to New York City and got a job on Wall Street. And so it was really through tennis that got me my job. They wanted me to play with all the hedge fund billionaires and go to the Hamptons and do that that sort of circuit, if you will. So it was really tennis that you know allowed me those opportunities when I moved to the city. Amazing. So it's an it is an interesting pivot, though. I mean, from uh, from Wall Street, and I suppose with the with the love of sport sort of in your in your blood anyway. Maybe maybe it is more logical than it seems. But what about this jump from um, from Wall Street into you know the world of sports tours? How how did that come about? Yeah. So you know, I worked on Wall Street for almost seven years, and I would come into work every day and you know kind of punch your stamp and wake up not wanting to get on the subway and, and go sit at, you know, sit at a trading desk. And so instead of doing that, I've always wanted to work in sports. I knew that was my destiny. And it's so cliche for people to say, well, I love Tiger Woods, so I want to work in golf. No, I genuinely knew my, my, you know, my calling was to get into sports. And so through tennis, I met the owner of IMG, the late Ted Forsman, and just through the interviewing process, you know, landed a job at IMG, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't for the faint of heart. It took a year and a half of interviewing and it was just, you know, calling, being persistent, and then finally getting a job in what was called business development. So I could walk into a meeting and I could sell you anything that IMG owned, operated, licensed, or represented. So it was a pretty vast, you know, deck or pitch book we called when I would walk into a meeting. So it taught me a little bit, but it was just more of getting your foot in the door and figuring it out. So that, you know, coupled with my business acumen and love for sport, it was really kind of a natural niche and, and a natural fit. And, you know, from there, I played tennis with the chief uh, legal counsel at the time of the Atlantis. And he took me to lunch one day and he, and he said, look, kind of inside, you know, intel here, but we're not going to renew Michael Jordan's celebrity golf tournament. You know, we need something to take its place. I'd love to introduce you to the CEO of the Atlantis. And so I immediately thought college hoops, like what better, you know, you're on an island paradise, there's a casino, you walk around and you see people wearing, you know, a Syracuse hat, a Duke t-shirt. It's just the the power of, of college athletics, especially in a beautiful place where it was just kind of the perfect storm. So I start my own company, leave IMG, get down there, sort of pitch this whole idea. They love it. Well, because the Bahamas was not part of, not to get too granular, but it was not part of an NCAA bylaw that included Canada, Mexico, the United States, or any U.S. territory to have these early season tournaments. I had to add the Bahamas into that bylaw. So it took me about a year to do. So the, so the Atlantis paid for 
I went to Istanbul, Turkey to pitch Coach K. I did, you know, I, I meet Louisville at the Big East tournament there at Madison Square Garden in New York City and get Louisville behind it. There were so many random, I stalked Jim Calhoun. I went to 20 UConn games. And so that's how I got UConn, you know, to get behind this. So it was just the power of, of marketing and networking and winning this piece of legislation. And then after winning that, it was, it was New Year's Eve when I found out in 2010. And so 2011, we want to have the tournament. Well, usually these teams are booked out several years in advance. So the first team that I signed was UConn, who ends up winning the national championship that year. So it was really kind of fate and so much hard work that went into it. But it was just, it's the true, you know, the old adage, take the stairs. You know, it's, there's really no easy shortcut in this industry. And it's just, it's building upon those relationships. So that's a very, very microcosmic scope on kind of the, you know, the foundation of how Battle for Atlantis was built, which was the, the foundation of complete sports management, which has come, you know, so many other things have come from this, but that was the main foundation of what we were built on. Well, you said it was the power of marketing. It sounds like it was the power of persistence as well. I mean, geez, talk about yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, just just hunting people down and, and just you know getting and just you know forcing your whole body through the door, not yeah. just your foot. Oh, That's yeah. amazing. And, um, and you probably played a little role in maybe UConn winning that that championship. You know, them being playing in that 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 tour- that tournament might have just might have just been a, a little factor. Well, it was funny. It was one of those things where you know Kemba Walker was on that team. They win the national championship. He gets drafted. There's an NBA lockout. So Kemba actually comes down to the tournament. So he was like my honorary guest. And so to have the the defending national champion in our inaugural year in this little tournament that I created at 131 Sullivan Street in New York City, it was just one of those surreal. People talk about like you've had so many cool things in your career. What are moments that you remember? And that's a moment when – you know, getting them, I was at the national championship and watching them win. And it was just sort of like, wow, you know, I have them in this tournament that I created from scratch and changed legislation for. So it was one of those really super surreal, you know, episodes of my, you know, we call it trilogy of everything that, you know, we've had going on with complete sports management. Incredible. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that, you know, you've been been running Battle for the Lands for some time now, but it was a, a first last year mm-hmm. um, with uh, the, the so, uh, women's team playing. How did that come about? I mean, it, it was, you know, many years in the making. It should have happened earlier than it did. And just through my contacts traveling the world, um, being so heavily involved in the men's basketball, you obviously meet so many people in the women's basketball. So I'm very dear friends with Gina Oriema and Don Staley. So when you get the two mm. sort of goats of women's college basketball in your inaugural year, you know, I found a sponsor. They paid for it to be on ESPN. We're, at the time, we were the only women's event to even be on e- ESPN itself, didn't even have their own events on ESPN. So we had such amazing content. They put us on ESPN. And in my women's final, I had a UConn, South Carolina, which was a preview of the national championship last year. So we got to see. Keeps happening, keeps happening to you. <laughs> keeps happening. So it was, you know, Aaliyah Boston and Paige Beckers and AZ Fudd, like all these incredible women. And then, of course, two Hall of Fame coaches. You know, one, the winningest mm-hmm. coach in the history of college basketball. The other in the Hall of Fame as a player and a coach. It was just one of those really, really cool incredible moments and also the power of women's basketball. I mean, my women's final was rated higher than any of my men's games. So it was just, it was incredible. So I it was sort of like, how, how do we beat this year? I kind of knocked it out of the park too well, much. <laughs> oh, I was going to, I was going to ask when you run something for, for 12, 12 odd years, um, how do you go? Obviously so much planning goes in. Um, there's so, there's just so much work. But you always, you know, anyone who would run something like this annual, like, how do we make this a little bit better each year? Mm-hmm. Do you? Have you? You know, is that is that we the have. conversation you always have? You know, what, you know, you do a bit of analysis and say, this went perfectly. This could have gone a little bit better. Maybe that's where the improvement is. Or, you know, let's innovate and bring, you know, bring something totally different to the table. What What's yeah. that conversation like after, after you wrap up each time? Yeah, it's, you know, we always debrief. How can we get better? We never want to be yeah. on cruise control. It's, you know, 
the content comes from the teams. You've got to have the best teams. So continuing yep. to cultivate those relationships, my relationship with the television piece, getting a better time slot, getting better games, you know, getting better matchups, you know, getting more sponsorships involved, getting the country of the Bahamas more behind it. You know, the Atlantis has been an amazing partner, but there's always room to grow. And I think if we think it's never going to get better, you know, I, I hope that doesn't happen because that means it's kind of the beginning of the end, right? Whereas I always feel like there's there's room to grow and and ways to just celebrate the sport and celebrate you know everything that we're doing and also you know celebrate the country of the Bahamas who has been so you know behind and passionate about this and you know just little things getting Bahamians in the tournament I've had DeAndre Ayton I've had Buddy Heald I've had Shaquille Clear Tum Tum Nair and I've had several. Bahamians that are in it that really you you buy into the community so I've got you know my women's tournament I've got Old Miss where their head coach is a Bahamian woman so just you know being able to celebrate you know the the, the environment that you're in so yeah, well that was one of my questions as well you know what does having having a tournament like this every year and uh, in a place like that, what what does that mean for the local people? You know, people that are not coming to the games, you know, feel like they're involved. Is it's yeah, it's got to do wonders for for, for the uh, for that country um, and the sport. Yeah, I mean, it started really the foundation of major sports tourism for the country. So it's been, I mean, I would say the biggest sporting event in the history of the Bahamas. Just what it's done with the television, the heads and beds, bringing in the vat, you know, bringing in you know, how it spills over in all the other hotels, the other events that have, that have been created because of this event. So, you know, it's working closely with the Bahamas Basketball Federation, working with the prime minister. I've worked with three prime ministers now. So it's, I, I would say, I think everyone there would say it's been a layup, all pun intended. It's been incredibly successful. Amazing. So obviously these aren't the only uh, only uh, international sort of tournaments or tours um, that you that you put on. Mm -hmm. um, I think recently you've, you've you've taken taken teams all all over the place, lots of European yeah. trips. I mean everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a bit a bit about those um, because I mean that would be that one one thing to run a tournament every year and you kind of know what takes each time, but. You know these these um, what's in it? What's in it for these teams going on these? Uh, are, they, are they off season trips? You know, is that usually yeah. when you do them? And mm -hmm. what 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 does that take? So once every four years, men and women's teams are allowed to, to take what's called a foreign tour. So literally, throw a dart, they can go anywhere in the world. And what it does, it allows you to get ten ac extra practice days with your team. So with the transfer portals, with one and done, you know, with such a, a shift and change in the way that college basketball has become, it's really a total advantage for teams when they're able to do it. So every year we're growing in the space, you know, this past summer, I took Auburn to Israel and Palestine. It was the first power five team to ever go into both of those countries and do a tour. I took LeBron James kids at so it was it was great. We got to take Sierra Canyon to, you know, London, Paris and Rome. And so, you know, dealing on this team alone, you have LeBron's kids, you have Penny Hardaway's kids, you have Scottie Pippen's son, you've got Derek Fisher's son. So just the, the collateral that you're responsible, you know, in three countries, live television, security guards, it was just it was monumental. You know, and just and seeing what this does for these kids. I mean, at the end of the day, they're, everyone's still, you know, human beings. And, and it's just to be able to be in a part of the world you've never been to and see what this does for these programs is, is genuinely priceless. So what I'd like to know is um, it takes a lot of, a lot of trust for um, somebody to put, to put in you to run um, a, a tool like this, especially with kids. Um, and so what, mm -hmm. what's, what's the secret recipe to cultivating those relationships in the first place? Understand it takes time, you know, and, you know, well, you sort of touched on that at the beginning, you know, it takes what it takes, um, mm -hmm. you know, by, by meeting some of these people, but what's your, what's the secret recipe there? Yeah, it's just, it's being genuine. It's being honest. It's obviously you have to have proven results to be able to do stuff like this, but it's also, you know, developing these relationships and coaches knowing when Lee Miller calls me and tells me she's going to do something and something's going to go in a way that she's described, it's going to happen. And so we've just, 
there, you know, again, I go back to, there's no, there's no corners that you can cut with these guys. These guys recruit for a living. They read BS from a mile away. And so they're going to understand if they can trust you and if they can, and then you lose that trust, you're never going to regain it. And they know with me, and it's also tough conversations. You know, it's, you know, having the ability to tell them something maybe they don't want to hear, but they need to hear it. So it's just, it's having that mutual respect. Yeah, no, I understand that. And with the sporting background that you have, you kind of understand the mindset uh, of an athlete or a coach. For sure. It's got to help. Um, what probably been on quite a few tours with college age students. Tell us about some of um, some things. Tell us a story about something that maybe you had to think on the fly or, you know, they're college kids, right? Very, very, very disciplined, of course, college co- um, co- yeah. college athletes. But, uh, yeah, tell us, tell, tell us uh, something that might have happened on, on a tour that you can. You don't have to know the college, but you can I mean, if you want. <laughs> well, it's. I mean, we were in Israel and we went into Palestine and I'm sitting in the front seat. We're going over the Palestinian border back into Israel. And I take a picture. I'm sitting next to Bruce Pearl, the head coach. And I take a photo of the security guard. You know, you're, it's Palestine and Israel. Not many people have been able to do this or say they're allowed, you know, they've ever had the chance to do no. this. So the security guard with a machine gun comes on the bus and grabs my phone and says, delete that photo. We saw what you just did. And it's one of those like rush of blood down the head, like the Coldplay song, rush of blood to the head. I was like, oh my God, it was just one of those things. And Bruce is laughing. He's like, this is a great memory. Hashtag we're making memories. And I'm just like, I am glad you are so cool because I am dying a slow death right now. Like, you know, we've got the whole bus, we've got media, we've got, you know, parents, we've the whole situation. So that's an immediate story that comes to mind. We have so many. There, nothing ever goes right. And you, if something does go right, you question it more than when it doesn't go right because you know it's not going to go right. So it's just pivoting and being on the – I mean, we've dealt with such high profile. You know, We've had so many players who have gone on to the NBA. We've had so many Hall of Fame coaches. It's just nothing ever goes right, but it's like a duck paddling under the water. Just – you calm, cool, look beautiful and majestic, but you know you're paddling really hard to make sure they think nothing's happening. So that happens a lot. I bet it does, <laughs> and that's a skill. Just look like you're fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> We're good. We got this. We're good. Just as I drew up. Um, so yes. let's uh, let's just talk about – just switch lanes a little bit. Um, when – you know, you you probably have a pretty good idea around what – what good content is because you need a broker deals with ESPN. <laughs> um, and so yeah. what, what would you say they're looking for when you, you know, you're, you're, you're pitching a, a new idea, you know, what's the, what's the thing? Well, I mean, it's the level of the content. They want content. They want very high content at a very low price. And so it's such a saturated market. There's, you know, in, in the world of, college basketball, also in college football too. They, they just, they want premium content. They, you know, with an ESPN, they know they're obviously such a worldwide leader within the content and showcasing, you know, sports to the world, but they always want that next best thing. And so it's just, there's no secret recipe for it. Like, do you have something we'd be interested in? And by being interested, it's something that's going to move the needle when you turn on that television is it going to, you know, are they going to get sponsorship dollars for it? Are they going to get ratings? What's the viewership going to be like? Is it worth their time? Is it worth their production investment? It's, you know, anyone can do a time buy and go pay a lot of money, but you're never going to get a prime window if it's not good content. So that's what they're looking for. Interesting. And so you've, and, and more recently, you've, uh, you did a deal with, um, with, with Peacock TV and that, that, that's, mm-hmm. that's, 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 you know, obviously a streaming, a streaming service. That landscape might be cha- changing mm-hmm. things a little bit. Does it change much for you and uh, and what you're sort of you, you discuss when you've got you know a, a tournament to promote and get and get coverage? For? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it for sure does. It's you know, look at the NFL on Amazon Prime now as a digital with um, the biggest sport you know outside of you know European football in the world. So it's it totally it opens it up. Like you know, when people you know when they watch their content, it's how many people sit in front of a TV now? Most of the content I get is through my phone 
or through my laptop when I'm traveling. So with Peacock, I mean, it's not small potatoes here. They're launching the Olympics. They just did a multi-billion dollar deal with the, with the Big Ten, who they acquired, you know, UCLA and USC and starting in 24. So the world's changing. And if you stay, you know, grandpa may still be sitting there watching his TV at five o'clock on a Friday, but most of the world's not. So you have to change and adjust. And with this game, they were willing to take a chance on, you know, what my idea was. And, and so were the two universities that I worked with, you know, Mark Few and who's the head coach of Gonzaga and Scott Drew, the head coach of Baylor. They're very much think outside the box. Let's take a chance. Let's see what this will be. If it flops, it flops. You know, we're still going to get on linear, you know, networks but if it's you know succeeds like it's a home run and it, it was a home run amazing and there was obviously another big component to that deal first of its kind um from an nil perspective which mm-hmm. has just been is, is, is taking off um in the last 12 months yeah do you want to touch on that one as well yeah it was you know to be able to get players you know paid not to play in the game but to activate content around the game and you know pay them, you know, heavily for it for very little work was a home run. It was a slam dunk. So I'm really appreciative for Peacock, who they were the title sponsor for the event, but also, you know, a sponsor for the NIL activation. I mean, they really were a key piece in getting this done. Amazing. And do you think um, any conversations you have going forward with any tour or tournament that might get some coverage, you know, this is, that is this is, part and parcel now this is part of everything that you'd have to factor in you know does it change much for you moving forward yeah we've got a lot in the pipeline that i obviously can't discuss right now but we've got a lot you know happening and especially you know when you have when you have um all these international events and you have international players on these united states teams they're not allowed to get paid in the u.s they can only get paid when they travel abroad so it's huge for and the the world of basketball has never been more global. Look at the best players in the NBA. They're Ante Dekupo, Jokic, Doncic. I mean, all these guys. So the recruiting and and you know the amount of players coming from abroad onto these teams has never been heavier. So to have that NIL, to have someone who understands how to activate that in a way that's respectful of the players. It's not a quick one hit wonder but it's also doing due diligence and allowing them to participate in a piece of the pie where the American players, they can go down the street and do an activation with Joe Blow. You can't do that when you're a foreign kid. So, of course, that comes into play in all the stuff that we do. Interesting. And it's, it's moving quite quickly, the landscape in general around NIL. Do you, um, where do you see that in the next sort of year, two years? Because it's a little bit wild, like, not wild west now, but, you know, it's sort of everyone's just sort of running around a bit. Yeah. Kind of- it totally well, okay, is. fine. <laughs> but trying to run around and figure out, you know, what to do yeah. with this thing, you know, is it better to move quickly and sort of jump on this now, or ultimately there have to be some governance that might start to come in? You know, it might not be from the NCAA, but it might be from um, somewhat, you know, the play, mm-hmm. something, a, a body with the players trust, or you know, um, something like that. So, yeah, wh- where do you, where do you see that going in the next in the next year or two? Might get more organized. Right? Yeah, I mean, well, they just the NCAA actually just did instill new governance, not a ton changed, but they're definitely trying to make a case of, you know, getting more around it, you know, getting it more contained, if you will. No one knows where this is going. If I gave you what I thought was an educated answer, I would be an asshole. Like no one knows where this is going. It is, it is the wild, wild west. It may be contained. It may continue. It may be the bell curve system where it flattens out. Or it may be people just, you know, and I'm not giving to the university anymore. I'm giving to that kid because that coach is going to be the reason that we win, not that new facility. So it, no one knows that, you know, there's, I find a lot of these universities, you have, you have split alumni bases. So you've got some who old school, they want that new facility. They want their name on that building. And then you've got the, you know, young generational money where these, you know, these alumni, the, the 40 somethings are, I want that number one draft pick. I want that kid to wear my t shirt. I'm going to be part of the collective and make sure we get this kid because I know he's going to the league. He's going to help us win. So they don't care about the buildings and the old school stuff. So, which is still good for colleges because you've got the two, you've, okay, 
perfect. So we're taking care of with what we need for the university. And then we're taking care of what we need for, for these athletes. I don't even call them student athletes anymore. Cause it's kind of a joke, right? So it's just such a changing landscape, but, you know, keeping your, your hand on the pulse and, and continuing to evolve the way that the industry is, if you're not in the game of NIL, you, you're, you're the train left, it's gone. And if, good luck walking to find us because we've, we've left a long time ago. So if you're still walking, complaining about what's happening in college athletics, it is what it is. It is what it is. So I'm just a firm believer in, you know, keeping up and adjusting in life and everything that you do. And so it's just that's it, it's, you know, it's a part of college athletics and all of them, whether it's women's gymnastics or men's basketball or college football. That's just, you know, it's where we are right now. Just another another thing that's shifting in this whole landscape, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, For sure. And, yeah, it sounds like you're on top of it anyway, so I think you'll be fine. Um, the <laughs> one thing that probably wasn't fine, <laughs> and I joked about you before we we, we, kicked, we kicked the episode off, was um, better mention uh, COVID because it is an events, it is an events business, right, and this is – you know, the best part about it is, you know, we're all, people are all together. Um, it's travel involved. I mean, there's not many things more heavily impacted. How did you manage that? I mean, you know, obviously you couldn't have it. Um, but, you know, what, what, yeah, how did you, how, what yeah. did you do? Did you hunker down, a bit more planning, made, made sure the next one's going to be mm-hmm. absolutely, you know, amazing? You know, what, what, what was, it, what was the, the mindset from you and your team? Yeah, COVID is actually the best thing that's ever happened in my business. So when we had to cancel Battle for Atlantis, I needed a home for these teams. So you, you know, there was no international travel. You, you know, especially the lockdown in the United States. And instead of just telling the team, "Sorry, like go figure it out," I got nothing for you. I interviewed multiple places throughout the United States. And who do you want to partner with? in a pandemic. Well, to me, it was a multi-billion dollar healthcare company. So that's what I did. So I found Sanford Health based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and started a new event there. And we had the best testing, you know, ESPN plummeted, all these events got canceled. We didn't, we figured it out. So we had the best testing in all of college athletics. We PCR'd, we had a huge truck that was brought into our convention center. And because of these doctors and the technology and money that Sanford has, we were able to get the PCR testing back in two to three hours versus three to five days. So we tested all these kids in the safest way possible. We kept them in a bubble. There's no true bubble outside the NBA because we don't have billions of dollars, but we kept them in the safest environment you could have, tested everyone every day, PCR tested, not antigen, and pulled up. We launched college basketball. We were the first tip off in all of college basketball. And that brought us a new client through Sanford. So it was, it was hell going through it. It was stressful. It was one of those things you get PTSD, even like thinking back what we went through, but in the long run, it brought us another client and it gave us so much clout in college basketball for pulling off what really hardly anyone else was able to do around the world. So it was a total bless. I, I don't want it ever to happen again. I'm done. I'm over it. No more testing. Like we're good. Sniffles go in the next room. Like I don't want to see it, but it was a total blessing in disguise for us, for the company. Lee, Lee you're a bit of a tour de force, aren't you? My God. <laughs> you just get stuff done. <laughs> just get it done. Just you gotta get it done. <laughs> if, it's not, if it's not you, who else? Because no one else is going to no, get it done. So right. Um, so. Final one for you. Have you ever taken a, uh, a tour to Australia before? Yeah, I was All just right. there. So I was there for three weeks in Sydney. So we were there for – my husband runs USA Basketball. So we were there to win the gold medal in Sydney. So it was it was so fun. We love Australia. We love Australian basketball. And, you know, I would love to start bringing – teams there was actually slated to bring a college football team there their star center the university of minnesota was australian and then covid hit so you know couldn't do the trip but we love australia it's one of our favorite places at park hyatt right there in sydney is one of my favorites i I mean we we we, uh it's just huge Uh, u.s basketball is just so so big in australia 
you know, you name it, college college mm-hmm. to the NBA, you know, we're all over that. We've got good representation in the league. Um, and so whenever any yeah. team comes over, we're, we're all over that and we have been, we have been the last few years. So, Yeah, I'm actually at the University of Arkansas oh. right now for meetings with them tomorrow and the, the head coach, Eric Musselman here, he was the one who recruited Ben Simmons to LSU. He was the assistant that got Ben Simmons to LSU. So he's got a huge Australian contingency and all that. Amazing. So a little bit of Australian ties here. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, hope to see you uh, bring bring you to yeah. it down soon. But in the in the meantime, just keep doing yeah. what you're doing. It's been amazing speaking to you. Such an oh, it's an interesting you. journey, and uh, and uh, well, and um, good luck, good luck uh, moving forward. Yeah, Callum, I really appreciate the time and for y'all having me. And best of luck to you. Thanks.